Okay, so we're gonna play d4. Now, I previously played the London. In this game, the England. Now, who wants to know how to refute the England? Now I gotta, I gotta show up to the party here. I've analyzed this. Now I'm gonna actually play the best line against it. Okay, so he goes d6. Sadly, tutorial, tutorial, he doesn't play queen e7, which is the testing move. d6 just gives up a pawn. And basically, what we wanna do here is trade on our own terms. e takes d6 would allow him to develop his bishop. Can we try to get him to take on e5 so that we trade queens? Can we try to get him to be the one to trade on our terms? We absolutely can. We can do it by developing a piece, bishop to f4. I hope I'm not falling into a trap. As far as I remember, this is the best move. If he takes on e5, we capture the queen, well, we trade queens. And because we're up a pawn and his position is passive, that's a trade which is quite desirable for us. We can also take on d6. There's nothing wrong with that. Black doesn't have sufficient compensation, but I think this is the safest move. And you can see that it's already put, put him in a, quite a bind. Okay. I'm going to use this opportunity, Agat Mater style, to drink some water. And uh, pause the video at this point. And if you're just along for the ride, uh, the moves. And you can't out tall tall. Okay. Um, what is the best? Well, that's a bit of a general question. Oh, the Rosen trap is e takes d6. I'll show the Rosen trap. That's actually quite a beautiful trap. Um, let me take a sip of my water exactly. So he's kind of dumbfounded right now. Black doesn't, we just shut him down completely. Because, okay, so bishop g4. Now, of course, e takes d6 is much better because he's going to end up with a backward pawn here. Uh, whether he takes with the pawn immediately or he takes with the bishop, he's going to end up with a bad pawn. And to add insult, okay, so he takes. Now... Let's not forget about development, right? Uh, just because the, the opening has been successful doesn't mean we should get arrogant. Uh, we should simply continue developing our pieces, which we are going to do with knight c3. e4 is also possible, but uh, we can also play e3. And I'm actually going to do that. The reason I didn't play e4 is because I'm a little bit concerned that he might get his queen to e7 and sort of x-ray me. Okay, great. He's gone d5, but remember, he's down upon. Just because he got his pawn to d5 doesn't really mean anything. Okay, well, let me think about this for a second. So what does he want? What, what does my opponent actually want to do? Where does he want to develop his pieces? Let's annoy him a little bit. Well, there's something that he wants specifically. Where does he want to go with this bishop? What has d5 accomplished? He wants to go bishop b4. And that actually is a bit of a nasty pin because he might ruin my queen side pawn structure. Right? So let's actually play the move a3. Let's annoy the heck out of him. This is not a move that I'm making lightly. I'm delaying my own development. But because he sacrificed the pawn and because he isn't developed fully himself, I have decided I've made the judgment call that I can get away with this. And I'm only two moves away from deploying, you know, from finishing my development. I could consider castle and queenside, but that would sort of play into his hands. And I was going to make the point, uh, which I'll expand upon after the game. Okay, I'll, I'll talk about it after the game, and I'm going to note it down here in my notebook. Okay, so queen b6 is less dangerous than it appears. We can shut this down several different ways. Uh, one is to develop our bishop, but then he might go a6. We can absolutely just go rook b1. There's uh, nothing wrong with that. Okay, that's just a working, working person's kind of play, uh, but there's absolutely nothing wrong with that kind of play. Okay, uh, we're just going to defend the pawn. Uh, x gear 13, 13, and... What you, what you are going to see is that uh, that's actually quite annoying to deal with. Okay, he castles. So now he wants to play d4. And uh, that's a good idea, but he's, he's going to run out of fuel. Well, knight a4, he, he had queen a5 check here. But we can set a vicious trap. Now, here's what I see. Look at this queen very carefully. Look at this queen very carefully. Where can it go? What are its two squares? It's only two squares. Name them. Ladies and gentlemen, c5 is one and a5 is the other. Let's go b4 and take them away from him. He might fit. It worked like a charm. Now, mister, where is your queen going? Where exactly is that queen going to go now? Nowhere. It is trapped. Let's go. And I'll show you guys exactly where I saw this before. 
yeah, so d4, he blitzed out very quickly. But this is a typical idea. As he's thinking, I'm not going to waste any of you guys' time. I'm going to pull up that classical game, that classic game, which uh, which first taught me about... Let me see if I can find it. It's Polgayevsky against Tima, two very strong grandmasters of the past. And this is one of the shortest games ever played between two world-class grandmasters. Watch. So, um... Well, let me, Nanuka, thank you. Let me first make sure that he actually loses because maybe he's waiting for me to switch scenes and uh, he's lulling me to sleep and then he's going to make a move with two seconds. Uh, and don't worry, I will actually go over the game in detail. Yes, okay, so I heard the sound that I like to hear and now I'm going to switch scenes. Now, this is Timon against Polugayevsky. Timon was a legendary player. I actually played him in 2016. Uh, he's... he's very much still around, he's still good, uh, but he was basically one of the top in the world in 1973. Polugayevsky was sort of a Russian classic. He was uh, he was the man uh, here. He was not 25 years old when he died. That's a chess-based glitch. Uh, but yeah, he, he died young, but he was one of the strongest players in the world in the 60s and 70s, one of the strongest players in the Soviet Union. Uh, and uh, that's this is what he looked like. If I can move. Uh, what he looked like was, if I can remove my webcam, I'm trying to actually m remove my webcam. Well, okay, you can see part of him anyways. I'm not going to twiddle around with it right now. Uh, but he was very strong. So in this position, private butters, thank you for the prime. Timon plays knight to d5. Whoa, what kind of a move is this? Black can't take on d5. This is a very typical move in the knight. Or Timon is ripping open the entire position. Okay, doesn't matter right now. Polugayevsky goes queen to a5 he says no 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 no. i'm not i'm not going to uh, cooperate with you let this knight just sit here okay if you take on f6 no big deal i'm just going to take back what does timon do here it's not exactly the same thing that i did but it's very very similar all of a sudden white does what he doesn't go b4 i know some people are thinking that because b4 relinquishes the a3 pawn Called it. <laughs> Goes knight to b3. Very, very, very quiet move. Look at this queen. If it goes to a4, the queen gets forked. In fact, even if it weren't for the fork, you could drop the... I think this is beautiful how both knights come back from the d-file onto the third rank. Look at this geometry. And then you finish off the queen with a3. The queen is trapped. And if queen takes a2, then you still go knight c3 and the queen is still trapped on a2. So Polugayevsky resigned, a 16-move game. Uh, sorry, 15-move game. Uh, rarity for sure, but this is where I first learned about uh, the prevalence of this. Queens can absolutely get trapped in the middle game, and some people aren't aware of that. Uh, you, you have to become aware of that. Uh, queens can absolutely get trapped in, in the middle game, and you should be actively looking for this stuff. Now, back to the game. So in the game, in the action, I think I might be frozen, no? So queen e7 is the sort of classical move. And here you go bishop g5. That's actually the strongest move according to my analysis. Now some of you will think, wait a second, that is the trap. That's one of the Anglin traps, but this is actually still the best move. Bishop to d2. Sorry. Queen takes b2 and now knight c3. Uh, there is a queen sacrifice here that was sort of patented by Amman. Uh, and, and that queen sacrifice basically goes, let me remember it. Bishop b4, rook b1, queen takes c3. I won't delve into the theory here. I will be coming out with videos about this stuff. But white is simply winning here. Uh, this is just not enough compensation for the two pieces. It's just very, very hard to play for black. Thank you, Fewitil, for the prime. Anyways, that's just very, very quickly how you should play against the England. Uh, what is the Rosen trap? The Rosen trap is bishop c5, knight c3, d6. Uh, can somebody uh, just... Assure me of this for a second. Sorry, let me pull up an instance of the game here. So the Rosen trap is where you go bishop c5, knight c3, d6. And now you play... No, 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 no. Sorry. How does it go exactly? It's bishop c5, but it's not knight c3. What is it? I think it's like... What does white usually do here to allow this? Oh, it's bishop f4 or something. And then knight e7. If the knight is on c3, it doesn't work. And the idea is obviously if takes, then bishop takes f2. And queen takes d1 wins the queen, right? Uh, so if you if you've gone into this position, what's the what should white do here? Bishop c5 without knight c6. Sorry, 
So bishop c5, now d6, and knight e7, okay? So I'm going to verify this, but what should white do? And in fact, we should do exactly the same thing that we did in the game. We should make sure that we trade this pawn on our own terms. e3 is passive. It blocks in the bishop. We, we don't want to block in the bishop. Where should we put the bishop? We should put it on, not on e3, then he takes it. We should put it on f4. That's the best move, I believe, in my estimation. Because what we're trying to do, we're, we're, not, we're still not threatening d takes e7, but we're trying to get him to take with a pawn in order to weaken his pawn, much like happened in the game. Now we can play several different things. The simplest would be to go e3, then develop the bishop and simply castle. White is up a pawn for no compensation. Everything is good. Do not take on e7, ladies and gentlemen, because you lose your queen and the bishop takes f2. Uh, I don't believe e3 is the best move here. Uh, e3 is also fine. Uh, and of course, white is still up a pawn for very little compensation, but I think bishop f4 is slightly the, the the more ambitious move so either is good listen to eric i defer to eric on this he's analyzed this i haven't uh, i haven't analyzed it formally so i absolutely defer to eric's judgment here uh anyway so in the game he played something a little bit more boring we went e3 everything we did here was by the book and now this idea of b4 how did i see this well i saw the idea of net a4 and i i was like wait this almost traps the queen the queen is only one square, which is a5. Can we take that square away preemptively? Yes, we can. And bishop a, knight a4. I actually don't think that black is a good move here because knight a4 is a huge threat. He has to go bishop d6 in order to create an escape square for his queen. But now we can simply take and we can go bishop e2. And uh, we're totally fine here. Now, if he goes d4, a trick that I've shown on several occasions, what should we capture the pawn with? Tricky question. A6, maybe B5, and we make the queen side explode. So, by the way, this Rosen trap has been around for a while. I don't know um, if it's been around for a while. Let me see. I'm checking reference to see if anybody has actually played. No, no games found over the board. That's just Eric's novelty. That's pretty impressive stuff. Um, so, knight takes D4 is correct. Look at this bishop. It's hanging. If he takes, we take the bishop. If he takes on e2, we don't take with this knight. We take with the other knight in order to buttress the knight on d4. Okay? Um, hopefully that makes sense. So that, that would have been a quick example of, um, of applying that kind of tactic in a different position. Um, it was GM Derek's idea. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, I like Derek a lot. He's awesome. Great streamer and... and uh, he was the one who came up with this, so kudos to Derek. That's still a pretty impressive thing to come up with something like this. But the pawn is pinned. I hear people say, wait a second. Which pawn? Are you guys talking about it? I'm not sure what people are talking about. Knight takes e2 is fine here. Um, which pawn is pinned here? Yeah, I think that was about a different position. That was about a different position. So anyways, um, that's that. The one you capture with the knight. Well, it is. Oh, it is pinned. That is true. We can just castle. Great observation, ladies and gentlemen. The rook is undefended. I didn't see that. So you can't actually castle here. Or you could go, well, you could go knight b5. Uh, and and that's that's pretty awesome. I, I love to see this. I love to see people applying uh, the kind of stuff we talk about. And, and I can just sense the improvement. Great, great work. So, of course, knight a4 traps the queen. Any last questions before we go to the next game? I obviously I don't want to spend... Forever on these games, there's one more thing I wanted to make. Sorry to talk so much. One more point I wanted to get out. I think it's important. When I do have something planned to play. Now, when uh, you play against somebody who plays a gambit, uh, you need to do some psychological investigating. Because basically what you need to tell yourself is, okay, the guy that I'm playing wants to get a very sharp position. So that is also partially why I played bishop f4. People who play the England, they, the last thing they want is a is an endgame, particularly one down a pawn. So the psychological decisions you make have to reflect on what you think your opponent wants to do, right? What kind of position does he want to get? That's absolutely a viable way of playing. If you're playing your friend, you know he loves sharp positions. Getting into an endgame is a very viable strategy. Mark Dvoretsky had a whole lecture about this in one of his books, and it really made a big impression on me. You're playing a real person, you got to know that person and you got to make decisions partially on the basis of what that person likes and dislikes. You don't want to take that too far, but that is something you want to bear in mind. 
Let's go with the next one. I know. Okay. So we've been playing the Accelerated Dragon uh, almost constantly. Okay, let's play the King's Indian. So that's what we've been playing against D4. Uh, and, and I've been introducing you guys to some basic ideas in the King's Indian. Let's see what, what he does. Okay, he plays E3. So kind of a passive system. It's not bad. Uh, he plays basically the Kali. Okay, this is really passive. And the Kali against the King's Indian is actually not that great. Uh, because I'm not going to play d5. Uh, what pawn break am I going to prepare? And those of you who play the King's Indian, you have an unfair advantage here. But uh, there's basically two main pawn breaks in the Sicilian. One is to go c5. That's more Benoni. Sorry, in the King's Indian. One is to play a Sicilian style with c5. But the other is to prepare e5. That is more in the spirit of the King's Indian. First, we have to go d5. Of course, of course. First, we need to prepare it. Now we need to prepare it by developing the knight. Usually the knight goes to d7 in the king's Indian, but because he's played it so passively, I'm going to allow myself developing the knight to c6. And now we're going to play e5. Now I hear you guys think, whoa, 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 you're blundering a pawn. He goes b5, he attacks the knight, and then he takes the pawn. But guess what? Look at how white has developed his pieces. If the center opens up, all of these weaknesses he's created, his lack of development, that's going to make its presence felt. If you play the King's Indian, you got to be ready to sacrifice on a moment's notice. And so he correctly refrains from going b5. Now, how should we continue? Uh, what, should, what do you guys think we should do here? Should we go e4 and close up the position, attacking the knight? That would be a very sensible decision, but I don't want to do that quite yet. Let's just improve our position with rook to e8, just bringing the rook to a good square. And uh, then we can develop... I mean, what you have to understand about these openings is that uh, they're not unlike other opening. King's Indian is not something that you have to play in this sort of weird way. Uh, all of the rules apply. Okay, he pins us. Let's unpin ourselves with bishop to d7. Uh, so rules of development always apply. Hmm. So here we have a cool tactic. Who sees it? Who sees the cool tactic? So the bishop is undefended. How do I see this? What part of my brain alerts me to this? It's the bishop on b5. We've seen this time and time again. The bishops are at a standoff, which means that we need to consider moves like knight takes d4. Now, there are some moving parts here. If he takes on d7, the important thing is that we take on f3 with check, which gives us the time to recapture on d7. Now, it's not that simple. He can take with the queen, and then the queen can take b7. But if he does that, we'll be able to check it out. If he goes knight takes d4... We don't want to take the bishop because that very same knight is going to recapture it. We want to take the knight. And if that situation arises, we'll talk about what to do after that. That gets very complicated, uh, but we will work through the complexities. Uh, he is, of course, working through them himself. Okay, he, play, he plays a bad move. So he plays ED, which simply allows us to win a pawn scot-free. And this was his idea. So this is not a bad idea, but it's not going to work. And let me show you guys why. So 420 from Blaze. Thank you. We're going to drop the bishop back. First things first. He's going to take the pawn thinking, okay, I've won back the pawn, right? One, two, de two attackers, one defender. But what he hasn't anticipated, this is why I always harp on undefended pieces. Look at this bishop. Is the bishop defended? No, it's not. It's undefended, which means the bishops are at a standoff. It's the same exact principle as knight takes d4. It's just wearing different clothes. So what can we do here with black? There are several ways to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. We can go knight to d7, and we open up that very same standoff. Pawn can't move, and the pawn now has like a million different attackers, so we can just recapture it with our knight or our pawn, and uh, sort of the, the tactical skirmish is over. We are up a pawn. Uh, the, game is, the game is not over. He can go b5 and continue the pressure, so we're going to have some pressure to deal with here, but if we deal with it, we're going to be up a healthy pawn, no need to panic, just bishop to d7. His pawns are now quite kind of weak as well. And uh, the e5 pawn is nicely defended. So knight f3 would be a good move here from his perspective. And now I want to make something. I want to make a move that a lot of people are going to dislike. And that alone should be a big hint as to what I'm about to play. What am I about to play? <laughs> they say never make this move. Ah, close your eyes. Pray. We're going to play f6. Why do I get away with this stuff? Why did I play f6 here? I will explain that fully after the game. But the bottom line is, the bottom line is he doesn't have a light squared bishop. And that's in a single sentence why I allow myself to do this. He has no piece to contest this diagonal. In the meantime, I have a bishop that I can put on e6. 
in order to cover up the weakness created by the move f6. What about the other bishop? Well, that other bishop is eventually going to find employment through f8. Okay, so he takes the pawn. I saw this. Uh, and, and he's playing, again, very, very well. But I can also take a pawn. So I calculated this variation and concluded that uh, black is in good shape here. It looks like white has all this pressure, but I actually don't believe he does. We have a very nice move in this position. This queen on b7 is annoying. What are the weaknesses in white's position? Let's take a step back for a second. The queen on b7 is annoying. Observation one. Observation two, the pawn on b5 is kind of flimsy. Can we combine both and make a very nice queen retreat here? Where should we put our queen in order to excommunicate him? Yep, queen b8 is correct. Now, if he moves the queen, he gives up b5. If he trades queens, that plays right into our hands because that greatly reduces the pressure that's currently being put in our position. Hope that makes sense. We should take with a rook. And uh, now what should we do? Now we need to once again take stock of everything that's happening. Uh, first and foremost, white's threats. So white wants to go rook to d7 here. But what's more important here is the fact that the bishop is still undefended. And we can exploit this by undermining the pawn on b5, which cannot move. Should we play a6 or should we play c6? How do we go about the comparison here? So, hmm, I'm actually going to think here for a second. Should we make a third move? Now, the problem with c6, and the reason I'm actually thinking, is that uh, he might go, well, we're going to go c6. He's going to go rook to d7 here, which is kind of annoying because he counterattacks a7. a6 had a different flaw uh, to that move, and I'll explain that after the game. Uh, the move a6 would have met with a different annoying idea but after rook d7 what's what's the problem why can't i just take the free pawn well because at the end of the day uh, he's going to take a7 and i don't want to trade everything also the rook is very active but uh, there is a way that we can circumvent this we can take the pawn and instead of taking with the bishop we can take with the rook that's the key move because we attack b2 okay this makes it kind of easy for us we can just take a4 but he actually wow he finds a very nice idea rook takes a4 well he didn't see it but he could have taken on a4 and counterattacked our bishop. Now, what is the order of operations here? Priority number one is to defend the pawn on a4, preferably in a robust way. Let's go rook a8. Priority number two, this rook is his most annoying piece. If we can move that rook away from the seventh rank, which I'm going to attempt to do here, uh, we make it a lot easier for us to supervise the promotion of this pawn. If there is a rook on c7, there's a possibility he gets another rook to, c7, to, to the seventh rank. Uh, it's harder for us to be single-minded in the execution of our plan so priority number one now that we've defended the pawn is to get his rook away from here and we can actually do that by winning some material as well what should we do if, if you prioritize in the right way the moves play themselves we want to chase the rook away simple bishop f8 and he's actually busted here because he can't even move the rook simple and winning after we take that rook we're simply going to push our a pawn rooks go behind pass pawns it's not a coincidence I played the move rook a8. I anticipated that later his bishop would disappear, and that would make that rook look very nice indeed. Okay, so bishop takes c7. And uh, this is a good moment. Now, a3, does it blunder the pawn? Yes, it doesn't blunder it. But I don't really care. If I was playing a classical game, I would have gone king f7 here. Uh, but in the interest of sort of the blitz game, we can do this too. It's, it's, it's totally fine. And uh, even though he stops the pawn temporarily, our next priority is to get rid, rid of this rook. If we get rid of this rook, uh, rook against bishop is, is not a very fair fight. So where should we get this rook to in order to get rid of the e1 rook? It's a very, very simple maneuver. I'm sure you guys have seen this many times before. We simply dream up the, the best square. Not rook e4. Careful now. Rook e4 takes, and his bishop still controls the promotion square. So we'll win the bishop back, but... That's not what we want. We want to get the rook to b1. So as I said yesterday, be very careful about, you know, about trying to please the crowd and, and trying to play the fancy move. Try to play it simple instead. Uh, you'll, you'll get rewarded in the end. So rook b4 is the move. A rook e8 was fine. Yes, 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 this is good. And uh, let's play this as precisely as possible. Uh, instead of promoting, if he, well, he's going to resign. Well, actually, yeah, we can actually just promote. Um, I was going to try to actually take this bishop out of the picture entirely so we can make a whole queen. Um, but, but here, if we go rook e8, then, then he's going to, to take a2, and uh, we're going to basically get the same exact thing. So let's just freaking promote, and uh, we're going to be up a rook. This is an easy win. 
and uh, we're just going to go about training rook series if it was on time, but the game is over anyway. Okay. This guy was good. Uh, he, he resisted very, very well, so kudos. And uh, back to the open. So the way that he played is very passive. Knight c6 is relatively unusual. In the King's Indian, usually you go knight b to d7. There's many, many, many reasons for that. Uh, one of which is that normally white is the move d5. Uh, and that's exactly the question Wap Lobster is asking. But here we simply take on d5, right? That's part of the downside of how passively he's played this opening. So he goes b4. Now, if b5 and he takes our pawn, look at how weak this diagonal is. We go knight d5, everything hangs, and his position looks terrible. So don't stop when you lose a pawn. Calculate a little bit further. Okay, so rook e8, improving the position of the rook. Knight takes d4 is the key tactic that basically won us the game. This started everything. Uh, and if he, well... First of all, if he takes here, we take the knight, then take the bishop. If he takes here, and that's what he should have done, uh, we can. I would have just taken back. We could have considered playing dc, then he takes the rook. But in this position, there is a key move. If he just moves the rook meekly, then we take with the knight, and look at this monster pawn. We've got a million pawns for the exchange. But what key move does white have in this position? Because two pieces are hanging. Bishop b3. Uh, in which position? Yeah, so bishop takes f7, desperado, bringing the king out. Then he goes after the pawn, and the landscape changes because of how weak the king is. And we got more hype from run DMC for five gifted subs. Thank you, man. Bishop b3. So let's go to that point. Uh, I don't want to bore people to death. Boom, boom, boom. So knight d7. This I'll explain during the game. Oh, my lands. Holy smokes. Damn girl. This is unbelievable. 25 gifted from Chevy Chaser. Holy smokes. Can you believe this? It just continues. Huh. Oh, freaking believable. 25 more from Chevy Chaser has been so supportive over the last couple days. I'm so happy to, to see that people are enjoying this. And, and this is amazing. We are over 5,200 subs. And it just goes on and on and on. Um, that's that's Z486 with the tier 1. And we are on to 6,000. Ladies and gentlemen, we're on to Cincinnati. Uh, probably 300 plus, plus the donations. And Curious Jim Fancy just adds on to it with five more. Tack him on. Damn, girl. Five more subs from Curious Chimp. Whew. I got to take an espresso bean after that. Uh, thank you so much. This is amazing. And it continues. The 1.40 a.m. hype. That's what we're talking about. Just give me a second, guys. Amazing. Thank you, Curious. Always supportive as well. No, 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 you are. Okay, so can somebody alert me, please, to bishop b3? Where could he have gone bishop b3? I'm just not sure. Because he lost his bishop, so he doesn't have a light squared bishop anymore. Now, f6, right? Hopefully it makes sense um, now that I've explained it and now that you've seen how the game has gone. Uh, and the bottom line is that I'm permanently solving the problem of my pawn on e5. Uh, if we can compare this, you know what I would compare this to, guys? What I would compare this to is in my first game, I know it looks different. You see this move, d5? It's a move that leaves my opponent's pieces in the dust. Okay, that's how I would refer to it. Uh, and, and I'm doing exactly the same thing here, where I'm leaving three of his pieces to bite on granite, using that term again, and leaving them basically in the dust. Uh, and, uh, and, and now all three of his pieces are sort of doing nothing. Now, am I making concessions? I absolutely am. I'm weakening my king. But again, can't make an omelet without breaking some eggs. Okay, so on to the end game. Now, if we had gone a6 instead of c6, he could have gone rook to c1, all of a sudden counter skewering my bishop. And at the end, if I go bishop takes b5, he takes on c7. That's to his advantage. If I take with the rook, then the same thing happens, and he can absolutely make a draw here. Okay. So that's the reason I played c6. If he goes rook c1 now, I play c takes b5, and that problem solves itself. So people wanted to ask about bishop b3. Why didn't I go here? Well, uh, remember, you can move the rook and defend the pawn at the same time, rook a1. When you give a fork in your mind, you need to ask yourself, can my opponent move one of the pieces that are being forked and defend the other? 
And uh, if you ask yourself that directly, it's easier to find a move like Rook A1. Does this move look pretty? No, it looks ugly as frickin' hell. But sometimes, like I said in the last game, you gotta play ugly moves, okay? If you're in trouble, it's not about vanity and looking good and you know combing your hair in front of the mirror. It's all about the priorities, and the priority here is to defend the pawn. Okay, so C takes B5, and he found a nice idea. He could have played Rook takes A4, counterattacking my bishop. I would have moved my bishop. I'm still up a pawn. I still have good winning chances, uh, but he did a very good job here navigating this until he went bishop a3. He sort of lost hope, and at this point, the game is just over. We get his rook away from the seventh, we smoke it away from there, and we're up two pawns, particularly this pawn is the one that wins the game. Um, so why not bishop b3? So people are still asking this, but again, bishop b3 would not have been bad, uh, but it would not have won the pawn, uh, and it took me some time to see this. What about c6, then a6, instead of c6, then take? Well, c6, I mean... Oh, I could have gone a6. Yes, I probably should have. Uh, that was my original idea. I missed, to be honest with you, the move rook takes a7. I missed the move rook takes a4. Uh, so a6 probably would have been a better idea. And he can't take either of these pawns. I'm going to win the pawn. 